Congressman Colin Allred, thank you so much for joining us here today. We appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Um, last week, President Joe Biden took executive action saying it was time to, quote, secure the border. Some critics have called this a ploy for Democrats saying that uh, he's trying to gain some political points before the election. I'm curious, what do you see in terms of the Democratic Party as solutions on this issue that has been politically dicey? Yeah, well, you know, my family's from Brownsville. Uh, my grandfather was a customs officer uh, after serving the Navy in World War II. I spent a lot of my childhood uh, along our border communities in Brownsville uh, and the surrounding area, and this came back from El Paso. Uh, and I can tell you uh, that I've been saying for some time that we need to act, and so I'm glad to see some action. I've been critical uh, of this president. Uh, but I also think it's time for Congress to act. Uh, and that's why I find it so frustrating that when we had a bipartisan effort to try and address what we're really uh, you know, dealing with at our southern border, which is largely an asylum issue and needs resources put towards it, resources to process people faster, to change the standard uh, for asylum, uh, to reject people as well, uh, that that was turned away by folks like Ted Cruz, not because they disagreed with the policy, because I think they wanted to have the problem to run on in November. And to me, that has to be outrageous to every Texan. With the political realities of heading into an election year, this remains to be an issue for Texas and other border communities. What do you see as a path forward for Republicans and Democrats to come together and find reasonable solutions that address some of these core problems like asylum, which you mentioned? Yeah, well, listen, I, I want to make sure that we have a secure, uh, stable, uh, you know, much less chaotic border. And I will, when I am in the Senate, I will make sure that happens. But I think there, there's still time now for us to take up uh, the Senate bill that was negotiated that has billions of dollars. And I want Texans to know this, billions of dollars for border security that no state would benefit more from than Texas, for more CBP personnel, for more immigration judges, for more administrative personnel to deal with the, uh, the you know, increase in migrants that we've seen and the folks who are claiming asylum about 90% of whom are going to be rejected. But it's going to take five, six, seven years for that rejection to occur. That's what we're trying to address uh, in that uh, bipartisan Senate bill that Ted Cruz uh, said no to and that I have uh, supported. I hope we can come back to that uh, because for Texas, we can't just kick this can uh, down the road. We have to have a secure border now. With how lengthy the asylum seeking process is, do you think reinstating something like Remain in Mexico would be a feasible short term solution if Mexico were to agree, of course? Well, as, as you said, you know, part of that uh, is that Mexico has said that they would not agree to that again. Uh, but that's just one component uh, of the asylum issue. What we're facing here uh, is that when you have the numbers that we've seen, you have the backlog that we have, then we have to have resources put towards this. And that has to be the Congress. That can't be an executive action uh, because they don't have the funding for it. For us to hire more Border Patrol agents, uh, to take some of the agents who are currently having to do some of this administrative work and put them back to what they want to be doing, and I've talked to them about this, to be doing their actual job by hiring more administrative personnel and crucially by hiring more immigration judges to deal with the backlog and also to have some of these cases adjudicated much more quickly, uh, that is how we're gonna actually address uh, our asylum crisis that we're having at the southern border. And that will also send a message uh, to folks who are looking to come here that this is not the proper way to try and enter the United States. Uh, that if you wanna come here for a better life or economic opportunity, the asylum system is not the process for that. That's the legal immigration system. And there, we have methods for you to try and come in that way. Uh, I want to see us you know, funnel folks into legal uh, pathways instead of trying to come here using a asylum system that really was not set up uh, for these numbers or for uh, the reasons a lot of these folks are coming. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, one of the central messages of your campaign has been vowing to codify Roe versus Wade abortion rights being a really big issue that Democrats have been focusing on. Of course, in order to do that, Democrats likely would need control of the House, control of the Senate and the presidency without 100 percent being able to guarantee the outcome of the elections. You know, what is your message to your constituents here in Texas of what you can do about the situation if you're elected to the Senate when nearly all abortions are virtually banned in Texas due to state laws? Yeah, well, I just met with uh, Lauren Miller, uh, who was uh, a mother too. Uh, she had uh, a baby and then her, she and her husband got pregnant with twins. Uh, and one of the twins had a condition uh, that meant that it was not going to survive, that the pregnancy wasn't viable. Uh, and in fact, uh, she, it was going to also kill the other twin 
uh, in her womb. Uh, and her doctors said, basically, we can't treat you here in Texas. You have to try and find another place to go. And so even though she was incredibly ill, uh, she traveled out of state uh, to get the care that she needed. And she's here testifying in front of the Senate today. Stories like that, I think, drive home how important this is, that we restore this right for Texas women. And it can be bipartisan. Uh, we have two senators in the United States Senate uh, on the Republican side who've said that they uh, want to uh, restore Roe v. Wade and they're pro-choice. So this is something that we can uh, do, I think, in a bipartisan way. But I want Texans to know uh, the only way we're going to do this at the federal level, and the only way we're going to do this also, is by replacing Ted Cruz, who wants to have a nationwide ban on abortion, who has supported uh, the status quo that's happening in Texas to mothers uh, like Ms. Miller, uh, that is to replace him with somebody who actually will care about all of us and will try and take us back to the standard that we've had for the last 50 years. If there is a bipartisan path forward in restoring protected uh, abortion rights nationwide, is there wiggle room in the Democratic Party in terms of the weeks that um, women can get an abortion. Uh, of course, we know with Roe, it was around 21 weeks, which is the viability standard. Um, most Republicans think that is too far. So would Democrats be willing to walk that number back to say 15 weeks, for example? I think what most Americans expect is that we're gonna go back to the standard that we've had for the last 50 years. And that's the standard under Roe v. Wade, in which states do have uh, you know, certainly actions they can take uh, post uh, viability, and that's that's where I think we have to go back to. Now, I recently interviewed Senator Ted Cruz on his proposal to uh, protect in vitro fertilization. Of course, Senator Duckworth had already introduced a similar bill, and I was asking him about how Democrats and Republicans can come together on this issue that clearly both support protecting IVF, but again, back to that issue of it's an election year, there are political realities there. How do the parties work together on these policies like protecting IVF that the majority of Americans support um, when we are an election year and both Republicans and Democrats can gain from wanting to pass their own version of this bill? Well, let's be very clear. Uh, IVF is at risk because of Ted Cruz, uh, because of extremists like Ted Cruz. It was not at risk at all. It did not need protecting before uh, some of the policies that he has supported uh, you know, found their way uh, into actually impacting women's lives and families' lives. And that's why we have to have this discussion now. And I kind of compare it to, you know, like if uh, somebody robs your house and then tries to sell you new locks the next day, they're responsible uh, for what they did and now they want to tell you how they can fix it. Uh, that has to be uh, you know, outrageous to Texans uh, and to us as Americans. Uh, but I do think uh, we have to protect IVF, but we have to do that also in the context of restoring freedom to Texas women overall to make their own health care decisions in consultation with their doctors and their families. So do you think his proposal for protecting IVF is ingenuine? Well, it, it seems that way to me, and it seems pretty blatantly uh, political. Also, it is true that in 2016, when Ted Cruz was running for president, uh, he uh, supported uh, the personhood amendment that would have made things like IVF uh, illegal. Uh, and so this is a change from him in terms of flip-flopping and I think now trying to come back to what most Texans and Americans understand is reasonable. So far throughout your campaign, you've been trying to draw contrast with Senator Cruz, um, painting yourself as someone who is bipartisan, someone who is willing to work with other parties to get legislation passed in Congress that um, it seems difficult in a divided Congress these days. Um, Senator Cruz has had this reputation of being a conservative firebrand, but we've been seeing a shift even too with his campaign strategy, rolling out the Democrats for Cruz uh, campaign ads. According to a ProPublica analysis of congressional voting records, Cruz does have a slightly higher percentage of voting against his party compares to yours. His is at 8.2%. Yours is 6.2% in terms of voting against the Democratic Party. Uh, is Ted Cruz more bipartisan than Colin Allred? Uh, that's outrageous. There's a reason why I've been named by outside groups the most bipartisan member of the entire Texas congressional delegation. Uh, and there's also a reason why I've been given awards for it. Uh, and it's because uh, it's not, certainly there's a difference between the House uh, and the Senate. And there's also a lot of times when Ted Cruz is voting against policies uh, that have been put together uh, by Republicans that then he is opposing because he's so extreme. Uh, so if that's voting against the party, I guess being the, bit, the most extreme senator in the country, I suppose, could count as that. Uh, but being bipartisan means working across the aisle to get things done. And we see that show up when you're actually trying to pass bipartisan legislation, like the infrastructure bill that's bringing $35 billion to Texas over the next five years that I voted for, that Ted Cruz voted against. Well, the Chips and Science Act, which is bringing 
uh, high tech manufacturing back to the state of Texas. Really no state benefiting more from that than Texas. I voted for it. John Cornyn voted for it. Ted Cruz voted against it. Or just recently in our uh, national security package, support our allies in Israel, Taiwan and Ukraine and humanitarian aid, what's going on in Gaza and around the world. I voted for it. John Cornyn voted for it. Ted Cruz voted against it. He's an extremist. He has been for 12 years and we all know who he is. Walk me through your decision making process when you are making those choices to vote against your party on um, legislation that you might, you know, disagree with the majority. Um, I know you've done that before, but what does that decision making process look like? Well, it, it does depend, of course. When we have a very narrow majority as we've had, a lot of that process goes into shaping what the bill will actually be before it even gets to the floor. And that's something that I've been proud of. But I also have co-sponsored 73% uh, of the bills that I've co-sponsored in my time in Congress have been bipartisan. So I am actively trying to find Republican bills uh, to add my name to and also to join, to have them join with me in trying to find bipartisan legislation that we can advance. Uh, and so there's only so much I can do, obviously, as, as a member of Congress with 435 of us. But as a senator, I'll have much more latitude and ability to work even better across the aisle. And there's one thing we know about Ted Cruz. He will never be a part of that. And I think for every Texan, whether you support him or not, you know he's not going to be part of bipartisan efforts to get anything done. Um, now shifting gears to uh, your predecessor, if you will, the last Democratic nominee for U.S. Senate, Beto O'Rourke. We saw a pretty long and aggressive campaign style. He was crisscrossing the state. Um, of course, it is a very challenging aspect to be a sitting member of Congress and running a campaign, but can we expect you to be ramping up um, those events throughout the state, talking to voters in different areas, or are you trying to do a different playbook since ultimately, of course, O'Rourke did lose? Well, we've been all around the state, and we're going to continue to, and we'll continue to have even more uh, events, of course, but you know, I've really enjoyed going all across uh, you know, this beautiful state that I'm a fourth generation uh, Texan and that I know so well. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, but, you know, listen, I'm a different candidate. It's a different year and it's a different election. Uh, and I'm certainly uh, want to make sure that Texans know who I am, uh, that, you know, I was born and raised in Dallas by a single mom. I made it to Baylor on a football scholarship. That's a big deal for us to the NFL and have served in Congress in a way that's shown it's possible to bring folks together. You don't have to be pitting folks against each other at every single junction. Uh, and that it is possible, for example, to be endorsed both by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, because I work well with our business community, but also by the FLCIO, because I believe in supporting folks' ability to organize and to helping our workers. It's possible to have a senator who will work for all 30 million of us instead of one who only cares about himself. Work certainly seemed to also in his gubernatorial campaign focus a lot on trying to get voters who might have been Republican or independent to switch over to vote for him. Are you more focused on getting people to turn out in those already heavily blue uh, areas of Texas where there's large populations, but um, you know, there are a lot of voters do sit home. So are we gonna be focusing, seeing a lot of focus from your cam campaign on getting people to actually turn out as well? I want every Texan uh, to know who I am and to have a very distinct choice in front of them uh, between the most bipartisan member of our entire Texas delegation, all 38 of us, uh, versus the most extreme senator uh, in the country. And so whether you're a Democrat, an independent, or Republican, I want you to think about who actually cares about you and your family, who will actually go to bat for you and your family. And so I, I want to appeal to everyone. And I don't ca discount any Texas voter. Uh, I, I don't think that party lines are particularly how most Texans see themselves. I think they see themselves as somebody who's hoping that uh, their elected officials are working as hard as they are. Uh, and when you see we have a senator who, when the lights go out in the en energy capital of the world, he decides to go on vacation to Cancun and later blame it on his family or say, you know, what could I have done staying? I couldn't hang up electrical wires. Well, then, you know, we have a senator who's not doing that. And I'm somebody who will. Lastly, what can Texans expect to change in their leadership in Washington if you're elected to the Senate? Well, I'm somebody who wants to make sure uh, that we're trying to get things done for folks uh, and that I don't let uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good, certainly. Uh, but also that I'm proud of working across the aisle and trying to do it in a way that everybody feels like uh, they have some skin in the game, but also uh, that shows, I think, our common values. And that's one of the things I've been most concerned about over the last few years as you know, a fourth generation Texan, somebody who knows us well, went to school at Baylor, grew up in Dallas, uh, is that I see efforts to pull us apart uh, at the seams of our communities and to pit us against each other and to try and pretend like you know, we're not all uh, you know, Americans, that we're not all Texans, that not, we're not all ultimately on the same side. I think we are. Uh, and whether that's, uh, you know, somebody in rural Texas 
or somebody you know, near my district in Dallas, I want them to know that I will care about them every single day, I'll go to work for them every single day, and that I'll try everything I can to help make their lives better and to put them in a position to succeed. All right, Congressman Colin Allred, thank you so much for your time today. Good luck on the campaign trail. Yeah, thanks, appreciate you.